<laughs> well, it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, um, Dr. Peter Weiss-Pensis is uh, from UC Santa Cruz. Peter is a lead PI on a collaborative project that he and I and Wes and Dan um, all have, uh, um, as well as all our students and um, an unusual assortment of uh, fog people. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's in from uh, the Central Coast of California all the way up to Humboldt. Um, you're going to hear more about that today. Um, Peter earned his undergraduate degree at UC uh, Santa Cruz in chemistry before heading up to the University of Washington in Seattle. At UW, Peter earned his PhD in chemistry also, um, where he also made the transition from bench top laboratory analysis of um, determining structure of organic compounds that he had in Santa Cruz to environmental analytical chemistry, um, focusing on atmospheric processes. And after several prominent papers in photochemistry with uh, uh, big names like Ali Zafirio and others, um, uh, studying the production of uh, carbonyl sulfide, carbon monoxide, and ozone, Peter was bitten by the mercury bug. <laughs> and uh, with his first presentation on mercury in coastal precipitation appearing in 2003, now this, this actually was a comment um, on, a, on another paper um, published by Russ Flegel, an old moss landing her, uh, and um, uh, Peter and Russ got into a bit of a scientific row about this, and the publication was actually a criticism of the Stedman Flegel article. Um, and it may be that this academic row uh, led to uh, his postdoc with Flegel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, Tenuous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, keep your friends close, but uh, your enemies closer. Um, Peter later published a highly cited paper on the elemental gaseous mercury in the marine boundary layer that same year, 2003. Um, and he's hung on to his interest in mercury, uh, publishing with several of our collaborators, and it's a great pleasure to be working with him now directly in this way, we can keep our disagreements out as a peer review uh, <laughs> literature. Uh, but more than that, we have found um, Peter to be both a passionate and compassionate scientist, um, committed to using science to make the world a better place. And uh, that's a large <coughs> challenge for us all. But if you need some inspiration, just Google <laughs> the singing scientist. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know if I'm more comfortable in the podium or in the puppet theater. <laughs> Singing scientists are kids, stuff. So. Okay, well, thanks, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm going to try to give you the overview and then the specifics of what we have planned with this funded project uh, investigating mercury in fog and in the coastal ocean. Um, so here's the, the title, Fog is a Potential Means of Transport of Methyl Mercury to Coastal Terrestrial Ecosystems. We still have the word potential in there because we just don't have enough samples as of yet, but we have some data to, uh, enough to publish apparently. Um, the initial study was published and featured on the cover of Geophysical Research Letters in 2012, and subsequent other media stories, New York Times, Scientific American, National Geographic, so forth. And it was the most famous study that had never been funded, but now we can't say it anymore because we got funded. So now we have pressures on, and um, this is what we're going to do. So uh, what, what we've looked at so far, just to kind of bring you up to date, um, quantify the concentrations of monomethyl mercury, which we'll abbreviate MM total mercury in summertime coastal fog water, um, identified a range of fog water deposition volumes depending on location and, and altitude. So we know it's foggy, but how foggy, right? Some places are wet and some places are just cloudy and, and dry. Um, so this is all important in trying to calculate a flux. Um, so we, we put some, we made an estimate of the mercury flux in fog with generous error bars. And, um, as a complementary study to this, uh, one of my undergraduate students started looking at uh, mercury concentrations in arthropods. And so we, we have some preliminary data on that. Um, we have some data on the dimethylmercury and monomethylmercury in the coastal ocean. 
show you that and the potential for the cocoa to be the source of methylmercury in the fog. And number six, it all leads to uh, developing and testing a new automated active strand cloud water collector, which we have an example of right there. Um, the idea of the, the automation is that the, the fog tends to come in at its thickest and most available for collecting a liquid sample at like 3 a.m. Okay, so I don't know if any of you, I know you're all dedicated, but you probably don't want to be manually attending fog sampler at that time. So we want to have a way to, to automate the system and have it come open, come on under certain conditions. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay, um, well, land, air, sea, cycling, and mercury is a big topic. Um, our major research questions are how important is fog in depositing mercury to terrestrial ecosystems? Um, mercury in rainwater has been fairly well studied. Fog is kind of a new frontier. In certain locations, fog water uh, input is important for the hydrologic cycle, certainly in coastal California. Uh, that can be the case. Um, so putting uh, constraints on the amount of mercury in fog and combining that with the amount of fog that is deposited is, is really our prime goal. Um, we, what we found earlier on is that the proportion of monomethylmercury in the fog was a lot higher than what had been seen in rain. So if that's the case, it represented a, a new and potentially important source of monomethylmercury directly to the terrestrial ecosystem, whereas traditionally people would think of monomethylmercury being formed in aquatic systems and sediments where you have low oxygen, but not so much atmospheric deposition of methylmercury because it's typically very reactive and not particularly stable or, or formed in places where there's a lot of oxygen, like the atmosphere. Um, and so if, the, if fog is an important uh, contributor of mercury to the terrestrial ecosystem, then what are the sources of mercury in that fog? So those are our two main questions. And um, I put the map here uh, just to some, some reason, larger context of why we'd want to uh, look at this. This is um, uh, locations of fish collected, sport fish, all along the coast of California, and the red indicates concentrations of mercury that exceeded 0.44 parts per million. So certainly exceeding the health thresholds. You can see the problem is widespread and um, certainly impacts the fish that, that people uh, like to eat. Um, I could go into the details of the mercury cycle, but this, this link here on, uh, the, from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute has a number of nice little animations on the mercury cycle. But I have a feeling that maybe we should wait to the end, and if there's questions on the mercury cycle I haven't addressed, then we can come back to it, because I want to make sure that we have time to get to the, the data and good stuff, and questions and so forth. But certainly, if anybody has any questions about just basic stuff about mercury, I'd be happy to answer at any time. Okay, so uh, this is an overview of the initial study. It was done in the summer of 2011. It feels like a long time ago already. Um, you can see this was our initial setup. Um, it was uh, this, uh, the small version of the active strand cloud water collector strapped onto a stool that my student here, Cruz, had in his backyard. And so you can see we were really trying to cut corners. Um, this is out at the Long Marine Lab where we collected a number of samples. Here we're um, spraying some deionized water in it to uh, clean it after every collection. And it has basically has a fan here that pulls in air at a uh, certain speed across these uh, Teflon strings that are, have a consistent spacing. And so with the, the diameter of the string and the spacing of the strings and the fan speed, the um, efficiency of the cloud water droplet can be calculated. So these are the parameters that we have uh, followed in, in building the new and improved model. Um, we made measurements at, on top of a roof at UCSC and at the Long Marine Lab. Um, and then there was uh, some passive fog water samplers that were located at these other sites. Um, the arthropods were collected at Elkhorn Slough and at Long Marine Lab and then up the coast a bit at Chalk Mountain. Uh, just some analytical details. We take the liquid sample and we preserve it with uh, hydrochloric acid. We're following EPA methods to measure uh, total mercury with 1631 and the monomethyl mercury. Um, and uh, like, like I'm showing, we have blanks and with ultra pure water. 
Uh, the blank is not 100% blank because mercury is ubiquitous. Um, we're trying to improve that now that the improved model has these doors on it that are going to protect it from you know, stray dust and sea salt and so forth. Um, but in the initial study, our blanks tended to average about 9% of the total mercury concentration and about 5% of the monomethyl mercury. Uh, this is the data that we collected in 2011 and 2012. And so the uh, blue is the 2011 data, the <coughs> red is from 2012. So you can see across different years, they're fairly reproducible. There's just a log scale here. So there's quite a bit of scatter. The squares are, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, let's go back. The blue is the total mercury and the red is the monometrical mercury. The solid is the 2011 and the half filled are the 2012. Um, and so this is all on one scale for just mercury. And um, you can see that the monomethyl mercury, which is in red, is typically lower than the total mercury because there are other forms of mercury. Yeah. Well, you're into the data, but I just wanted to have it clear on how it got sampled. Did you bring air in with yeah. fog and it yeah. either uh, adheres to, yeah. condenses or something on a string? Yeah. It drips down the string uh -huh. and into goes into a bucket. collection bottle. So you can't really see it very well, but that's the lid for a bottle that connects onto a tube, and that's exactly right. These are the, uh, for, neglect this one over here, but these are the strands, the strings, and the droplets basically coalesce on there and they drip down into a Teflon tray through the tube and into the collection jar. Thank you. And we take the liquid back to the lab and analyze it. You can think of it as a mechanical spider web. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thanks for clarifying. Okay, so, um, a couple things to notice here, we have some rainwater uh, samples as well, and you can see that, um, so here's uh, rain, uh, sorry, uh, what do we have here? yes, so this is uh, rainwater um, for total mercury, because it's in blue, and you can see that it, uh, and this is some more, more rainwater samples, um, the levels of uh, total mercury are maybe a bit lower, but on par with what we see in fog. But for monomethyl mercury, the amount in rain was substantially lower. Okay, so we have these uh, samples here tested for monomethyl mercury, and it was about a factor of 40 uh, lower than what we saw in the um, in the fog. So putting up the averages here, um, the total mercury uh, that we saw in rainwater uh, about 1.8 nanograms per liter. And the monomethyl mercury was about 0.1, uh, whereas in fog water the uh, the mean was 11.8, and the uh, mean of the monomethyl mercury was uh, four. So a higher proportion of the mercury in fog water was occurring as monomethyl mercury compared to the rain. That's the bottom line there. Okay, um, so. We combined the concentration of the mercury that we saw with the, uh, an estimate of the fog water deposition volume. And this, uh, these data came from Dan Fernandez and his students uh, and collected from these um, standard fog collectors. It's one square meter. And uh, I think this is at the Big Sur site. And the fog collects on the, uh, this mesh and drips down into a, a tilted uh, tray and then through into a tipping bucket rain gauge. And I guess you collected the water there, just right? For just for fun, yeah, just to see how much. But it turned out to be quite a bit at the Big Sur site, uh, both Big Sur sites, uh, in like, what, a 90-day period, 432 liters of fog water. And this is just a, a piece of mesh, uh, basically oriented toward the prevailing wind. Um, the fog deposition varies quite a bit. So the red line here is the, uh, the marina site, or marina or is this a different site at Big Sur? Is it called it the Chaparral site? That was a different site at Big Sur. Okay, so it was a lot less. Um, and the blue was the grassland site at Big Sur. So obviously location is very important um, when it comes to uh, fog precipitation. So anyway, we took um, you know, the, the range of those values and um, developed a uh, nanograms of mercury per meter squared flux of atmospheric uh, mercury, and both in um, rain and in um, a dry deposition, an estimate of dry deposition, because mercury is um, reactive. The, the mercury two compounds are reactive in the atmosphere and will deposit out uh, just as gas 
phase compound. Um, but what we can see here is that uh, this is for total mercury flux, of these columns here, see these rows here, and these two down here for, for the monomethyl mercury flux. And what we can see is that for total mercury in fog, we're seeing a range that's obviously quite broad because of the, uh, in, the spatially heterogeneous nature of fog, but it's, it's comparable to rain, okay? And it's also comparable to dry deposition. Um, but for fog de deposition of monomethyl mercury, it's far and above uh, what has been calculated for the deposition in rain. And that simply has to do with the concentration difference. So monomethyl mercury concentration in rain is, is about 0.1 uh, parts per trillion, and we were seeing as high as nine parts per trillion. So you don't need as much fog to get as uh, higher so this is basically what we published in the 2012 paper saying that, you know, here we, we discovered a potentially new source of monomethyl mercury in terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, subsequent uh, to this, as I mentioned, we collected some arthropods and found interesting temporal uh, variation. So these are uh, collected at uh, Elkhorn Slough and at Long Marine Lab. And the wolf spiders showed an uh, interesting pattern along with the camel crickets, although we had fewer um, samples of the crickets. We had about 83 samples of wolf spiders. And these are just your small black spiders. If you go out in the grasslands anywhere around here, you will see them. They're very numerous. So we didn't feel too bad about taking uh, one or two or 80 for sampling. But um, the and this is the total mercury concentration, and as you can see that it, it obviously it peaks in, in August. So, and this is corresponds with the maximum in the fog uh, time of year at those locations. The camel crickets also peaked in that time, but the pill bugs did not. They were relatively constant. Now the difference, and one way to explain this, is that the spiders are much higher up on the food chain. They are carnivores, and the pill bugs are detritivores perhaps not uh, getting as much bioaccumulation. But of course, there could be other reasons for this temporal trend, but it is consistent with the uh, input of fog. So the jury's still out. Okay, and then uh, other complementary data comes from uh, Kenneth and uh, a, a class cruise from 2012, May 10th, uh, did some depth profiles at uh, two stations, uh, one and two. So CAS 1 went uh, down to 1,000 meters, and CAS 2 was much shallower. But you can see there is some vertical structure of the methylated mercury species in the water. Um, we have dimethyl mercury, which is two methyl groups on the mercury, and we have monomethyl mercury, which is one methyl group, uh, and the whole species has a positive charge that's usually associated with chloride. Um, typically, you would see monomethyl mercury concentrations uh, that, that would be higher than dimethyl mercury. Like if you went out to Elkhorn Slough, for example, uh, uh, monomethyl mercury in that water would mm -hmm. most likely be much higher than dimethyl mercury because dimethyl mercury is very reactive. It either converts to monomethyl mercury or it will go back to the inorganic form, uh, either ionic or the elemental form, where, which can evade. Um, but what we see is about a factor of 10 higher of dimethyl mercury, um, indicating some pretty active production, because it is, it is reactive. And we see a non-zero concentration at the surface, about 0.1 picomole, which was seen previously in a 2007 cruise, which I'll show the data of uh, in a moment. So we believe that this, that this water is super saturated with dimethyl mercury at the surface. There's a subsurface maximum uh, starting around 200 meters, and the structure with depth, we don't really understand why it goes up and down. Maybe you have some ideas. But if you take the um, 0.1 picomolar at the surface, and this was done by uh, Frank Black, one of uh, Russ Legal's graduate students, 2009, he assumed um, uh, the 0.1 picomolar surface concentration, and if you assume a dimethyl mercury concentration above the mixed layer, and you account for different wind speeds, because of course the uh, supersaturation and the flux is uh, highly dependent on wind speed, you can calculate a flux of dimethyl mercury to the atmosphere of uh, 0 0.035 to 0 0.95 nanograms per meter squared per hour, um, which likely is enough to uh, 
create a measurable concentration of dimethylmercury in the atmosphere. So that is another goal of this project is to try to quantify that. We've made some uh, strides in that regard so far, but uh, not the focus of this talk. Um, so what is the source of this dimethylmercury at depth? Well, we looked at transmissivity and we didn't really see uh, much structure that mirrored the dimethylmercury. We looked at the dissolved O2 and we can see that uh, there is a minimum that perhaps uh, matches up with the maximum in uh, the dimethylmercury. Um, we believe that it's being formed in the water column. Some other complementary data that we have is from the archive sediment cores from the USGS. We looked at sediment cores from these different locations color-coded by total mercury concentration. And you can see that the highest uh, mercury levels occurred on the edge of the submarine canyon nearby where these two casts were done in 2012, um, generally higher levels uh, along the canyon of mercury. But uh, we don't suspect a direct sediment source of, of the mercury at this point. Um, a couple of reasons for that, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, like I said, the sediment concentrations were enhanced in the vicinity of those two casts. However, no apparent relationship between transmissivity and dimethylmercury was observed. Um, dimethylmercury apparently stable in oxygen limited water below 200 meters. Um, and that corresponds to an oxygen level of about 50 micromoles per liter. Okay, so this is results from the 2007 cruise. Um, and uh, from Conaway, another former graduate student, Russ Liedel. And uh, I put up our depth profile here just for comparison. So they uh, measured dimethylmercury down to 200 meters on five different cruises spaced throughout the year. And the enhancements, the non-zero concentration of dimethylmercury at the surface, you can see they got all the way up to 0.3 picomolar on the, um, in their May cruise. Uh, the, but the enhancements at the surface were during the springtime, March 24th, May 27th. The other times of year, they see enhancements at depth, but nothing at the surface. So this seems to be tied to upwell. Okay, bringing, uh, but it's not just um, enhanced at the surface, it, it's enhanced all throughout the water column, at least to 200 meters as far down as they uh, investigated. So these were at the three stations um, and the open ocean station, M2, uh, did not see as big of enhancements. Um, you can see there more all the different uh, times the cruises are more clustered together, although there was some enhancement in that May cruise. Um, the M1 station see, shows the enhancement during the springtime cruises, and certainly at the coastal station, where you would imagine the upwelling would be most significant, uh, shows the greatest level of enhancement relative So a couple of observations. Um, the dimethylmercury is elevated at all depths during uh, profiles uh, when the upwelling occurred. So looking at this line here, uh, you can see it's enhanced at every uh, depth. Um, the dimethylmercury concentration shows a little variation below 100 meters. So it's pretty, if you go down below 100 meters, it's pretty flat or vertical. And um, because of that, we believe that dimethylmercury production is likely occurring That's what we hope to investigate. Okay, just a couple more um, interpretations of the data here. Uh, connection to upwelling. So with the limited data from the 2011 uh, fog study, so we had eight data points that we had monomethylmercury measurements, and so they're all listed here on these plots. And so we, we correlated monomethylmercury with these different oceanographic indicators as taken from the buoy that's at M1 out there a ways into you guys know. Okay, and so we have um, salinity, we have sea surface temperature, and we have the uh, delta T, the difference in temperature between the ocean and the air, and we have relative humidity. And so there's a lot of scatter. I'm not gonna read too much into this, but the pattern fits, okay? And I guess it passed the reviewer for the paper. They liked it well enough, and so we're gonna stick with it. So we see a positive uh, correlation with salinity. We see a positive correlation with sea surface temperature, and um, the, number in the parentheses here is just 
if you take out the darkly colored points, which were the ones taken at UCSC, the open symbols were just the long marine lab data. But we'll just look at all the data. So positively correlated with sea surface temperature, positively correlated with um, the delta T, the difference in the air sea temperature, and positively correlated with relative humidity. Now, if you look at, gosh, okay, so these two samples right here were the highest monomethyl mercury uh, samples where it was greater than nine uh, parts per trillion or nanograms per cubic, or nanograms per liter. And you can see that these corresponded, with, these are these wind, uh, wind sticks, so they indicate the uh, speed of the wind and the direction. And you can see typical upwelling uh, driving winds are these strong winds that are coming from the northwest, okay? A lot of these periods during the summer, it's windy, it's nasty, okay? <laughs> of upwelling, but then there's this relaxation of upwelling. So you can see the winds shift right here and they lighten, okay? And notice that the highest samples occurred during these shifts. And so what we're suggesting is that um, this relaxation of upwelling, the conditions that may be conducive to the oceanic degassing of dimethylmercury and also elemental mercury. So you have, you have the upwelling bringing it to the surface and then you have the warming of the water. It's still salty, but the water warms. So you see minus air is positive. And um, the sea surface temperature, it has warmed because the upwelling has stopped. And it's very humid because the air temperature is cold and the sea surface temperature is warmer. And so you're getting a lot of evaporation. So this is the model. It's almost like a pump. The upwelling brings it to the surface. The upwelling stops. And then it degasses. This is what we you know, hope to investigate. A little bit more um, complementary data to this. This is from the Calnex cruise where we just measured gaseous elemental mercury in the air um, and correlated that with seawater dimethyl sulfide and sea surface temperature. And this was right off the coast as the ship was going by off Big Sur. There was a clear upwelling signal with the chlorophyll. And um, we saw a correlation between uh, gaseous elemental mercury in the air above the water and dimethyl sulfide in the water. And then if you look at sea surface temperature, uh, you can see that the warmer the sea surface temperature, the greater the gaseous elemental mercury in the air, which is consistent with this, this model that there's upwelling and then there's some sort of warming that occurs that causes the evasion. Um, and of course, dimethyl sulfide um, aqueous is enhanced when the cells rupture. Okay, so it doesn't, the maximum of dimethyl sulfide in the water does not usually occur during the peak of upwelling and, and phytoplankton activity. It's a little bit afterwards once the cells rupture and spill their contents into the water. Okay, so that is bringing you up to date with the what we have measured and what were sort of the other data that we're inferring to bring this all together and make a coherent story. And this is what we are planning to do. So UCSC, Moss Landing Marine Lab, CSB Monterey Bay collaboration, stretching to 2016. The first component of this is the establishment of FogNet. And uh, we're having all sorts of fun with the word fog because you can attach it to almost anything, come up with new phrases with the word fog. When you've got a really foggy day and the fog is dripping and you're collecting a great sample, the appropriate ex expression is fog on. <laughs> <laughs> like fish on, you know? It's, it's, it really works because you're so excited. Normally you wouldn't be that excited about that kind of a day, but if you're trying to collect fog, that is like the, your birthday. It's so good. Um, so these are our locations, Trinidad Head, can be operated by Humboldt State Marine Labs. Uh, Pepperwood, Pepperwood Preserve. This is uh, north and east of Santa Rosa. So yet this is our sort of inland location. Um, it's 360 meters elevation. Uh, Bodega Bay Marine Labs can be operated by UC Davis. Uh, Montara Lighthouse, San Francisco State University. Uh, UC Santa Cruz, that's at a rooftop location on one of our buildings. Uh, that's our other sort of high-ish location. Um, we're right at the top of the redwood forest, so it is kind of, you think about the fog as the important input for the redwoods, we'd be collecting it right as it comes into the, the forest. And then Long Marine Lab at the coast, and Brazil Ranch, which is uh, just up the hill from um, 
Little Sur River or Deer Pot or somewhere in that, that vicinity. Very, very foggy location. Okay, so let's see this thing in action. This was just taken this morning. You can see I'm wearing the same clothing. And, uh, <laughs> This is, I don't know if we have sound, but we don't. That's probably just as well. So the, it, for these are for fog net. This, is for, this one is for the ship, so it has a special mounting bracket. But for fog net, it's going to open automatically. So these solenoid valves and uh, sorry, valve switches, they pull up the latches, the doors open. Uh, it's controlled with a Raspberry Pi, um, which takes the 12 volt power supply. And uh, there you can do it manually and make sure the doors are opening. There's our fan, it's going to turn on. Um, there it goes, it's turning on. Very exciting. Now, uh, in the next little video clip, I'll show you the criteria by which it, um, it opens. So there's the relative humidity sensor. It has to go above a certain threshold. We set it right now at 55, you could do 75. It turns on a small fan which has mesh that collects water. So when the droplets first start falling, they'll fall into this little plumbing coupler and there's a wire, two wires in there and it's a water sensor. So when a drop of water goes across these two wires, the Raspberry Pi will register that and turn on the, boom, there we go. It turns on the switches, turns on the fan, um, we have, we, we just installed these um, sensors to make sure the doors are open before the fan turns on because this, this box is kind of airtight and so we don't want the fan to come on with the doors not open so that's kind of our fail safe uh, mechanism. But uh, it, it works. starts. So if the power goes out, it, um, it automatically restarts. Um, and now it's engaged. So H is for humidity. It's 38% in the lab. The temperature is 21.5. H2O equals zero. So um, that's our water sensor. Uh, so now we're going to show you. Uh, of course, you know, yeah, I just breathed on the sensor. If we had the sound, you could hear the <laughs> so I breathed on the sensor, the humidity went up to 84, um, our fan is turned on, you can't really see it because it's spinning, but uh, we'll get a little cup of water, oh, it just went back down to 55, uh, 41, so we have to breathe on it again, there we go, the problem is doing this in the lab. Okay, so that's 83. Simulating fog and boom, doors popped open, fan came on. And that's basically all there is to it. And then when the water dries up, you can see it's a pretty good pull. These are pretty strong fans. It's a Bosch cooling fan for a Porsche 924. <laughs> so we've got good taste on this right here. Sophisticated. And then when the, you can see H2O is at one. And because of the power of the, of the Raspberry Pi and with the internet connection, see the blink, blinking light on the right is a Wi-Fi connection. So we can have all this data be sent, like an email message, text message. We're logging the data with the MySQL database. We can automatically upload it to a website. It's the power of this, and the, you know, these little Raspberry Pis are like 
$40. So it's, I mean, obviously we put more into that with all the sensors and, and everything, but the, um, it's pretty exciting what we've been able to accomplish with, uh, with this. Let's get that to run. Okay, all right, so the other, so that's fog high. So it is a microcontroller, and there are different um, varieties, different brand names. There's Arduino, there's Raspberry Pi, there's Beagle Bone. This whole, this whole do-it-yourself movement, um, these parts have been miniaturized, and there's a wealth of code online and sensors that have it. So there'll be these websites. One of them's called Adafruit. There's SparkFun, MCM Electronics. And you can buy their, it's not really kits, it's just, you know, you buy the Raspberry Pi and there's this whole huge list of components that are basically interfaceable. It's not like, you, you have to have some knowledge, it's not like, you know, anybody can do it, but the code is there and if you know, like I can do it. So I feel like all of you could do it. You know, you don't have to be a computer <laughs> science person to be able to figure it out. And the, the, the sensors and most of the um, components are like less than $10 each. So we're building eight of these and we're still staying way, way under budget as far as what, if we were to like, you know, buy this type of thing commercially and then pay some electronics person to wire up an automated system, it would just be, it would be prohibitive for the amount of money that we got to do this project. So, Keep your fingers crossed that it all works, but it, it appears to be stable um, over a variety of conditions. As long as we don't get salt water in the electronics box, that would be the main showstopper. Other than that, I think we're, we're gonna be okay. Um, okay, so the other part of this is the shipboard work, and um, we have two one-week ship cruises on the Point Sur planned for this summer from uh, Eureka to Monterey Bay, stations planted, uh, planned. It's all um, uh, sort of investigative at this point and uh, subject to what we see out there. We will be trying to collect fog from the ship at night, uh, so we'll be sort of going to where we think the fog is the thickest, and that might influence where we do the, um, the casts and the station work. Um, primarily, we'll be looking at elemental mercury uh, in the gas form. We'll be looking at dimethyl mercury in the gas form, and then the dissolved uh, total mercury and monomethyl mercury in the seawater. And uh, we'll, so we'll be looking at seawater, we'll be looking at sediment cores with the Vox core, we'll be collecting some phytoplankton and zooplankton uh, samples, um, uh, so doing some sediment water flux experiments on, on deck, uh, trying to collect marine snow with the, the three dives, and uh, so doing some deck incubations to figure out the methylation uh, properties. Um, the dimethyl mercury and the elemental mercury will be analyzed on board the ship because they're gases and they are, um, uh, well, certainly the dimethyl mercury is unstable and we'll collect the fog water and bring that back uh, when we're done for analysis. Could you explain decking incubation, Peter? Well, um, the quick overview, do you want to <laughs> jump in and join you well, guys? You know, this is a process that's happening. The signs are pointing towards in the seawater that there's a, maybe a variety of environments where 
the mercury can be methylated. Or if, if not a variety of environments, that it's occurring in many places throughout the water column. Not just like in each other. Uh, so there's the picture that Ken has sent of the tower uh, on, on the bow. And um, the bracket at the base of that is, so you can imagine, that's going to go right up there. And it's hinged at the base. It will be brought back uh, during the day and set up uh, starting 11, around 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. And we will point the ship into the winds, not getting stack gases. And hopefully we'll be getting some uh, nice drippy fog. Okay, so I thought I would put in uh, uh, a little bit about just fog in general because it is a, a very important topic. And that's a neat thing about this work. I mean, I'm focused on the chemistry of, in, in the fog and, and here at Moss Landing, focused on the chemistry of the seawater. But the, um, the fog itself, the quantity of it, and the climatology of it are uh, another uh, very important uh, avenue of research, and, and we're excited to be collaborating with people and fitting in to that. So it's just a nice community. Um, so coastal fog, um, this figure here is from Johnson and Dawson, uh, PNAS 2010, uh, which looked at the time series of fog occurrence, and I'll show you their plot in a minute. But just the background on fog. So basically, you have negative sea surface temperature anomaly. Um, and it increases low cloud cover by lowering the temperature of the boundary layer and thus increasing the lower tropospheric stability and inversion strength. Okay, so um, you've got where you've got this nice California current bringing the cold water along the coast. You've got the semi-permanent uh, high pressure system locked out there and you get stable lower tropospheric conditions which are conducive to condensation of water and this is the inversion, you can see from the Oakland uh, radio sonde, the balloons they send up, you've got temperature and relative humidity uh, in the nighttime and in the daytime, nighttime and daytime, but either uh, nighttime or daytime, there is a strong inversion where you have cooler temperature at the surface compared to aloft. Uh, subsidence from thermal circulation driven by the large temperature gradient between warm land and cool oceans results in low level inversion. So this is the temperature along the coast. You can see the narrow band of cool temperature and very hot temperature inland. This is a slice across 39 north where you can see it's about 16 degrees Celsius at the, at the coast and the Central Valley is uh, 34 degrees. And um, you know, if you've ever driven from Fresno to Santa Cruz or Monterey, you realize it's like a different planet. <laughs> um, and the fog, of course, is very, very important for the coastal ecosystem. Here's the redwood occurrence and the orange here. And when the fog frequency, which is a bit of a qualitative, semi-quantitative measure of the amount of fog, um, exceeds 35%, you, you, you're in that fog, uh, you're in the redwood belt there. And here's a visible uh, satellite image of the fog. You can see it occupying the Salinas Valley here, going well inland and having all sorts of beneficial ecosystem um, effects. Uh, such as providing moisture when there is no rain. Because of our Mediterranean climate, you can see this is the rainfall at Redwood National Park, uh, quite a lot of wintertime rainfall, but essentially in July, August, uh, almost nothing. Um, you know, it's very episodic. Uh, but that's when you have the maximum in your fog. Now this is fog days which is not necessarily precipitation. So with, with fog, we have to really be careful when we're talking about um, depth, as you do with rainfall, millimeters or inches. But with fog, it, it, it depends how you collect it, right? A redwood needle is gonna be a pretty effective collector of fog droplets, but uh, something with less surface area, it's probably not gonna get that wet. But because you have this complementary seasonal pattern, uh, the ecosystem value of fog quite high. In fact, um, this, the health of the salmon in the streams is also being tied to uh, fog occurrence. And so what is happening with fog? There's been some recent um, estimates of um, the climatological changes in fog frequency. So this is the Johnson and Dawson paper. And they found that this parameter that they calculated, T max, which is the maximum difference in temperature between the coasts and the inland location 
was a good uh, predictor, or it matched well the correlation coefficient of 0.84, the uh, fog frequency as observed from the Monterey and the Arcata airports. So because of this uh, pretty good correlation between the observations and their Tmax uh, calculated variable, uh, you can see the observations go back to like 1950, the Tmax, the temperature, could go back to 1900 because they have temperature measurements going back that far. They were able to reconstruct uh, what the fogginess may have been like. So if you look at this, you can see a clear downward trend. Um, going back to 1900, they can also look at sea surface temperature and their um, Tmax, and you can see a positive correlate. Well, it's positive because it's been inverted, but uh, there, there is a correlation there. Okay, so sea surface temperature, uh, the colder the sea surface temperature, the more the fog. Um, the warmer the sea surface temperature, perhaps the less the fog. So perhaps we're seeing a climate-driven response here in less fogginess. This is 2010. Now, most recently, 2014, Schwartz et al. found a similar downward trend since 1950 in coastal low clouds. This isn't necessarily fog, but what is um, uh, determined by these airports to be coastal low clouds at 20 different sites. This only looked at two sites. This looked at 20 sites from San Diego all the way out to the Aleutian Islands. And they found uh, that there was a decreasing trend in coastal low clouds and an increasing uh, trend in sea surface temperature um, at, at those sites. So um, perhaps we're getting into the fog game a little bit late if it's starting to disappear. <laughs> but that aside, um, we can almost certainly count on changes in fog in fogginess amounts due to climate change, and so it's I think it's vitally important that we uh, have something like FogNet in place, uh, if if not for uh, the, not only to understand the chemistry of the fog, but to in a monitoring kind of standardized way to uh, measure the deposition. That was my last slide, so I'll just sum it up here. We should get you guys out of here in under an hour. Um, so we've, we've found so far in our limited data set that the flux of total mercury and monomethyl mercury and fog deposition can be a significant contributor to the coastal mercury budget, and this warrants further study. So we're excited to do this. Um, some complementary information was from the arthropods, which found that there's more mercury during the foggy months suggestive of a relationship with marine and atmospheric processes. We're quite anxious to get at dimethyl mercury in the coastal ocean. We believe it may not derive from sediment transport, but may be produced uh, higher up in the water column in oxygen limited regions, which may be marine snow or phytoplankton right at the surface. Um, we'd like to understand the, if indeed the mercury and fog is coming from dimethyl mercury in the coastal ocean. That implies we need to really understand upwelling, followed by relaxation of upwelling, might be the most conducive conditions for mercury release. And finally, fog frequency may be decreasing due to climate change. Of course, it'd be nice to uh, collaborate with climate modelers with our fog data. And I'd just like to thank people, of course, National Science Foundation for funding this work. Uh, the initial Study was funded by the Packer Foundation. Um, we've got Amy who's doing a lot of the lab work. Mike gave us the sediment course. John Ryan helped with the initial upwelling analysis. Chad Saltikoff has been my uh, fog pie guru guy. Uh, Russ Flegel and his graduate students, May Gustin and her graduate students, and Alicia Torgosa, and who studies fog, and then past undergraduates who helped with the initial study. So thanks a lot for your attention. And <laughs>
so. I mean, these guys have done more total mercury analysis in the seawater, but the, the sediments that we looked at weren't particularly high. Um, as far as total mercury goes, um, I don't know. It, it, it's a deep, a deep well mix. We're not near big point sources, so. Yeah, I think the real um, the real surprise here was the was the dimethyl. Yeah, the speciation. The speciation and, and the finding of dimethyl mercury elevated, which has been looked found in other places in the in, in the oceans, but typically not in these in these coastal areas. Yeah, yeah. They, they're, dimethyl mercury has been observed at the surface in the equatorial upwelling and also in the Arctic, where you have funky biology going on with the sea ice. Well, I, 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 I guess it'll help if you just say yes or no. Yeah. It is it is gold mining any way associated with any of this locally is mercury at all at a point source part of the California issue or is it uh, you treating the ocean as the source of the atom and phytoplankton possibly and a combination of fog lifting up to get the dimethyl yeah. that you're concerned with? Well, uh, mm -hmm. well yeah, I mean that's a common question is what is the source of the mercury? You know, ultimately did it come from smokestacks? Did it come from mining? And certainly when we're operating in Central California, we have naturally enriched uh, strata you know, with mercury in it, and we had a lot of mercury mobilized during the gold mining. So we have to be very aware of that. And certainly in the San Francisco Bay, the total mercury is quite high. And you can see that uh, plume coming out when the bay outflows through the Golden Gate. But this far south, with the water being as deep as it is and well mixed, I don't think we're seeing In that case, most of the mercury, um, well, where if, if the mercury that's making it from into fog is coming from the sediments, then that is rather old mercury, and likely it could have been uh, a large component from gold mining or even natural sources from subduction and natural uh, naturally occurring mercury in rock. But if it's if the mercury is being methylated in the water column, then primarily the source of that mercury. Because it's, it's thought that the main uh, source of mercury that we see in the mixed layer of the upper ocean is from atmospheric deposition. So whether that's from the Industrial Revolution and it's just been cycling in the top of the ocean, in which case it would be our mercury, or if it's in the last 20 years, in which case you know, it would be Asian mercury primarily. About this, um, you were telling me that you thought that the, the methyl mercury compounds were being synthesized in the sediments. When did that? When did you switch your? Well, maybe I got it wrong, but when did you switch your thinking on that? Was it as a result of the of uh, the transect tenant stuff? I think yeah, that prim primarily the sediment core data that was looked at from the archive sediments, the, the values, the, the levels of mercury in those sediment cores were not particularly high, and then. But I think probably the most, if, you, if it was coming up from the sediments, you would expect a very heterogeneous profile, I think, because the, the upwelling is very heterogeneous and the sediment plumes, you know, if you look at the papers that they're doing, I mean, Bari and, and probably the school researchers here, they, they go into these very, you know, distinct plumes. They're, it's not like washed out everywhere. And, but the dimethyl mercury profiles seem to be, you know, just like constant concentration with depth indicating either it has a long lifetime down there and it's it's just hanging out so it's mixing all over the place or it's just being produced right there. And I tend to think it's probably being produced right there and that's just my gut feeling but hopefully we will design our experiments so that we can um, get, a, get at that. And, and certainly if it is being produced in the water column then it does point at the importance of atmospheric deposition and something that we can do more about. Because that's what the other question everybody has is like, well, what can we do about this problem? And it's like, well, you know, more, stricter mercury emissions regulations is what we're, we're facing.
There's a recent paper that I collaborated on where they looked at mercury in tree rings, um, trying to get at some you know paleo indicator of, of atmospheric uh, deposition or uptake, and um, we do have designs to collect plant tissue at, at these fog net sites. We want to collect you know spiders or other arthropods, plant tissue, maybe some soil, um, because if we are seeing it consistently high level of methylmercury in the fog, we'd like to see if that produces an ecosystem impact that we can you know, measure in the, in the biota or the soil. Um, but I don't really know much about like what has been done before. So I, th I think it's complicated because the mercury can migrate uh, once it's in the tissue. mentioned that like when mercury becomes methylated it's, it happens in a pretty anoxic zone by sulfur reducing bacteria. Is, is there anything in the like terrestrially in the bugs where in their gut systems maybe you run into that? So if they eat something and then maybe just elemental mercury or, or maybe just one species of mercury is you know methylated again, you know, in in that gut and then excreted and then that kind of changes the speciation of that mercury and then the content. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's? I think that's possible. Yeah, I mean, one of the prime things we're trying to keep out of the fog collectors is insects because that would they would present uh, an anaerobic environment where uh, you could have methylmercury being formed and being persistent. You know, so we really want to keep insects out. Um, as far as what's what was happening in the spiders, whether they're you know absorbing the mercury or it's in the food that they eat or they're producing it. In bioaccumulates, why would it be greater in August than in April? Or well, the lifespan of the spider is like um, nine months. Okay. So, um, and that, that's an interesting point, I think, because it, the mercury was highest in August, but then it went down in October. So, I mean, I don't know. It's, we, we weren't, like, putting ages on these spiders, but I, if you want to assume that they're, like, young in the spring and they sort of live all summer and they die in the fall, um, they were probably older in the fall, but yet they had lower mercury level. So I, yeah. I'm going to take you back to the atmosphere. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Getting creepy crawlies all over again. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, if, if, if emissions can be reduced, what kind of time scale are we talking about seeing that reduction in the, in the oceans? Um, well, it turns out know the answer to that question, but I can just give you some complementary information, and that is that actually, if you look at gaseous elemental mercury or total mercury in the atmosphere, which is you know 99% elemental mercury, and you look at the data going back, it's you know it's been measured since um, let's say 1995 reliably. So we have you know 20 years of data of 
throughout many, many stations in the Northern Hemisphere. If you look at those data, the mercury in the atmosphere is going down. And this, I presented on this at the AGU conference this last winter. Um, and the, the reason that, that the po most popular reason is that the oceans are absorbing the mercury, um, that, that they're taking up. There's less mercury being discharged to the ocean, and so the, there's less mercury in the ocean, and it's absorbing, it's absorbing more of the mercury. So, I mean, I think, you know, you talk about the time scale of mercury. If we were to decrease the emissions, we think that the, the lifetime of mercury in the air is on the order of a year. So we would expect to see some levels, you know, being decreasing, but it has this more rapid cycling component to it where you know mercury can wet and dry deposit to the ocean or to land but then it's photo uh, labile or uh, can be reduced back to elemental mercury through biological means and then become re-emitted so uh, it, it makes it for a challenging answer to you know challenging question to answer uh, the time scale for recovery I have a feeling it's pretty long with that, I'm yeah. going to leave you pretty long. Okay, thank you.